Welcome back to Grace Baptist Church. I am so glad to have you here with us once again this week. I trust that you and your family are doing well. And uh, each time we come to this part of the week, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you for a few moments here in the middle of your week. I hope that you're having a wonderful week and you're doing well. And uh, tonight we're going to continue on in our study of attitudes. And uh, we'll get to that in just a couple of moments. Before we do that, let me, let me welcome those of you that uh, might be uh, joining us for the very first time. We want to especially welcome you and thank you um, for joining us and taking a few moments to listen to our content tonight. If you are listening for the first time, let me invite you to find the comment section somewhere down below. And uh, there, there should be a place for you to fill out some information and you can send that in to us. We would just love to have a record of your of your, of your attendance tonight, but also, more importantly, just an opportunity maybe to reach out to you and get to know you a little bit more. You can also visit our website, gracenc.org. You can find some more information about our ministry there, and you also can hit the contact button, and you can email us if you have any other questions or information you'd like to know regarding our ministry. Let me also add, if you are watching locally here in Wilmington, North Carolina, we would love to have you come visit in person. We are having services here in our auditorium each Sunday morning from uh, one is at 9 a.m. and the second service is at 1030 a.m. And if you are new to Wilmington and maybe you're looking for a church family, we would love to have you come and check us out and watch us uh, here on our Wednesday night time, but also join us live in person on Sundays. I also want to invite each and every one of you and thank each and every one of you for your gracious giving to our ministry. As you know, I think all of our country is experiencing a similar dynamic uh, over the last several months that it's been a little bit more difficult to do the things that we used to do. And uh, certainly I know and understand that many people have lost and seen some reduction in income. And I, I certainly appreciate that and I'm praying for you about that. But as the Lord would enable you to uh, make a donation to our ministry, that is how we continue to provide not just this content, but other ministries that we are running. And so let me, let me encourage you to please give as the Lord would allow you to give. And you can once again give through our website. That website again is gracenc.org. And you can click the Give button, and that will walk you through how you can make a, a donation to our ministry. And I always want to add, every little bit helps, okay? It's just the, the faithfulness of God's people. Giving a little bit uh, allows us to provide the content and the ministry that we are privileged to provide. So, I've, as I mentioned, we have been studying uh, through a series on attitudes. This is session number seven. And as I've been doing in the beginning of each one of these sessions is just offering you a very brief summary of what we have discussed. And I've said this, I believe in each session is all the way back in session number one. What I really want you to think about with me and understand is that your attitudes truly are a choice. Okay, it is something that you choose and you have control over the attitudes that you betray and that you live out. And what we have been studying is the principle that we find in the New Testament that as believers in Christ, we are not sinless, we are not perfected this side of heaven, but we are called by the New Testament writers to put off the old man and to put on the new man. And what that includes is everything that our being is all about, and that includes our attitudes. And so we have been studying one week. We have been studying an ungodly attitude that we are to replace with a godly attitude. The very first one we looked at was complaining, and we are to replace our complaining attitude with one of thankfulness. We then studied the attitude of covetousness, and then we studied the next week we looked at contentment. Last week in session number six, we studied a particular kind of complaining, and that complaining is criticism. In fact, I make this distinction. Generally speaking, complaining is directed toward our circumstances, okay? I've, I've mentioned this in our church here um, this summer. As summer, by God's grace, in my opinion, is coming to an end. I, I made a commitment to the Lord 
way back in April or May that I would not one time complain about the heat here in southeastern North Carolina. You may not know me very well, but let me just share with you my philosophy on weather. It should never be above 65 degrees. It should never break the 65 degree mark uh, during the day. At night, it should be down to a nice and cool 45 or so. That is my preference, but as the Lord would have it, I live in a place that gets significantly warmer than that. And so I made a commitment that I would not complain about the heat and then added the caveat, well, but I didn't say I wouldn't complain about the humidity. Uh, the reality is we like to complain about our circumstances. We do that readily. Last week, we studied criticism, and while complaining is primarily directed toward our circumstances, criticism really is directed toward individuals. It's directed toward people. And what we studied last week was we looked at the issue of Moses in Numbers chapter 12, receiving criticism from his own sister Miriam, and then Aaron jumping in and getting involved in this criticism of Moses as the leader of God's people, understanding that the presenting symptom or the presenting issue for Miriam was that Moses had married a woman, that she did not agree with that marriage. But the real issue was that in her mind and in Aaron's mind, that Moses had superseded them, and they asked the question in Numbers chapter 12, verse 2, hasn't God spoken to us too? Who, who does Moses think he is? So what was motivating that really was jealousy and envy. It came out, what brought it to the surface was this issue with Moses' wife, but that wasn't the problem. The problem really was the fact they felt that Moses was receiving more attention than them, and it caused them to become resentful and bitter toward Moses, and eventually they began to criticize him. Now, before we get into tonight's counter attitude, I want us to remember that because of our sinful attitude, each and every one of us are prone to having a critical and judgmental spirit. It's something that is hardwired in each and every one of us because we are sinners. Understanding that when we talk about criticism, that very often our perception is wrong. Sometimes what we perceive to be true just isn't fact. Or there are times that our perception is incomplete. And so often we often uh, criticize people in leadership or just people in general with a partial understanding of what is happening. I've always said this for a very long time. It's always interesting, and we're in a, we're in a political season right now, and, and we certainly know that there's a lot of, uh, I'll say it this way, childish behavior going on in our country right now among our political leaders. And there's a lot of mud sing slinging, and that's always true. And it's easy for those of us who have never been president of the United States to offer criticism toward him. And that's part of it. As a leader, you're going to get criticized. I get that. But I've often wondered, what is it like if you are the person running against the incumbent president and you win? And you have been criticizing this president for years and you've run against him and you've challenged him and you've made all these statements about his policies and all of that. And I often wondered what it's like to walk into the Oval Office that very first time, and you're sitting behind the desk, and one of your um, administrators or someone walks in, and they hand you an envelope or folder that is marked top secret, president's eyes only, and you open it, and you begin reading information that you never had before, and all of a sudden you say, oh, that's why he did that. You see, we are all playing with limited information whenever we criticize someone. We never fully understand what they are experiencing. We never fully understand their perception. We never fully understand their circumstances as to why they made a particular decision. And let's be honest and, and admit and understand that there are decisions in life that we can have differences of opinion on, but there are, there are things, there are times, there are decisions that are not a matter of right and wrong. They're just a matter of, of preference. 
So we don't want to be like Miriam and Aaron. We don't want to be people of of a critical spirit. We don't want to be people driven by envy or jealousy to to criticize others and elevate ourselves. I came across a verse I want to share with you, actually a couple of verses, three to be exact. It's found in Numbers chapter, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 19. And listen to verse 16. And we find these words. This is Numbers 19. Listen to verse 16. You shall not... You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall, now listen to this, reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice this, this very important statement. Okay, Moses writing here under the inspiration of God, he says that we are not to be a slanderer. We're not to go around and, and have kind of this critical spirit it's like Miriam beginning this criticism of Moses, and then Aaron jumps in and he begins to complain. And very often we are slandering someone and slanderers and critical people. They love company and people jump in. So this principle is, hey, don't go around slandering people and speaking against your neighbor. Don't hate your neighbor, but you can reason with him Frankly, in other words, there are conversations that need to happen. There are times when you need to go to a leader or you need to go to a friend or you need to go to a teacher or or whatever it may be and offer insight in an open, honest way. But notice what he says. Don't take vengeance. Don't hold a grudge. But love your neighbor as yourself. My dear friend, if you would like to put an end to your critical spirit, and you would like to not be a slanderer, you would like to not tear people down, you would like to not be that person that consistently talks about others and questions people and, and, and shreds them with, with, uh, with hurtful criticism, the attitude that you need to put on is love. You need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We have to make sure that we are loving others. And by the way, as Leviticus shows us, there are times that when I am loving someone that I am, in fact, speaking frankly to them. I am speaking to them out of love and compassion for their betterment. So when I am offering criticism, again, there is destructive criticism that is intending to pull somebody down and destroy them. But there is criticism that is given for the spiritual well-being of that person. But the difference is, what is my motivation? Destructive criticism is motivated by pride and envy. It's motivated by arrogance or jealousy. But criticism that is offered to help a person grow spiritually or to keep them from danger is spoken out of love. Here's a reality. This is true for me, and it's, and it's probably true for you as well. I receive criticism pretty well from people that I know love me. I, I've had through the years, you know, my wife will offer feedback to me on a variety of things, whether it's a message that I preached or a class that I taught or, or how I parented one of our children, whatever it may be. But I know that my wife shares that information because she loves me. And as Leviticus 19 says, we speak frankly with one another, not meanly, not unkindly, but openly and truthfully for the person for the purpose of seeing the other person grow spiritually. So how do we respond when people hurt us? How do we respond when people criticize us? 
how do we how do we then offer criticism that is helpful and it is well-meaning how do we do that well as we all know relationships require a lot of work they require a lot of patience but we know the undergirding principle of every relationship as we read in leviticus 19 and let me read for you in first john 4 is is this it says beloved let us love one another for love is from god and whoever loves has been born of god and knows god anyone who does not love does not know god because god is love we are called to love one another and speak the truth in love now one of the most common scriptures is found in first corinthians 13 and we're going to spend a few moments in that in just a second of this description of love okay Paul in 1 Corinthians um, 13 is giving us a discussion and a description of love. And, and you probably are aware that the Greek language has many words for love. Okay, there's four primarily. But the one that Paul is using in 1 Corinthians 13 is the word agape. It's charity translated as charity in the King James Version of the New Testament. But this idea is describing a self-sacrificial Love, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm living in such a way that I am seeking the spiritual benefit of another person. Now, in the context of 1 Corinthians 13, this is usually read at weddings, and, and that's certainly appropriate to do. This isn't a wedding text, though. This isn't so much about how marriages work. This is about how, in the context, the body of Christ works. Because in Corinth, what was happening was there were people with particular spiritual gifts such as tongues that began to believe they were superior to other people. And so Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 13, I speak if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, I can be a gifted person, but if I'm not using my giftedness for for the right reasons and and motivated by love, I've just become sort of this noisy loud symbol. Now, in verses 4 through 7, Paul is going to give us a description of love. These are characteristics of love. And while there is aspect of feelings in these words, while there's aspects of emotion in these words, these really are descriptions of our attitudes and our inner disposition toward others that we are called to show the love of Christ to. Notice what he says in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when we read through this description, what we find is Paul is giving us really these attitudes that undergird our call to love our brothers as ourselves. Now, it says here that one of those that jump out at me, and maybe it jumps out at you, is that love does speak the truth. It does thrive in truth, but it is guarded by these other descriptions of love. Okay, first of all, love is is patient. It's long suffering. So let's take the idea of critical spirit for a moment. Maybe I'm on the receiving end of someone's critical spirit. Maybe I am the one that is getting unfairly criticized. Well, if I'm going to practice first Corinthians love, that means I'm patient with that person. And I try my best to not be defensive and to not be self-protective, but want to truly listen to their to their concern. I may or may not agree with that concern. It may or may not be accurate, but I have to show patience when I am the one receiving criticism. Now, what about the other way? What about if I am now tempted to be critical of another person? I have to also practice patience with the person that I am feeling critical toward. And asking myself hard questions. Is that the person's character that I'm being critical over them? 
Um, is this something that is a life dominating issue for them? Was that just a moment in time that maybe they had a moment of sinfulness and they they failed in that moment, but it's not their character. It doesn't characterize their life or even more particularly, I'm asking questions such as maybe I don't have all of the information. You see, before I often before I offer criticism, if I'm going to love that person, I'm wise to stop and pause and be patient with that person before jumping to conclusions. Paul also says that love is kind. It means that it shows mercy. So even if I am going to, again, taking the same same two sides of this coin, if I'm the one receiving criticism, I have to respond in kindness. Even if I am, as Leviticus 19 tells us, having a frank conversation back and forth, an open, honest dialogue and discussion about an issue, that doesn't give me the excuse to be, con- to be unkind. We, we have three children, and one of our children in particular tends to struggle in this area of maybe speaking the truth, but speaking it kindly. And we all fall into these traps. So if I am receiving criticism, I have to respond with kindness. If I am the one offering the criticism, I don't want to offer destructive criticism, ungodly criticism, but I am truly, honestly offering criticism for the spiritual benefit of that person. I have to be kind. I can be frank. I can be direct. I can be um, transparent, but it has to be guarded with kindness. Notice Paul says also in that description of love, that as I mentioned, it rejoices in truth. Okay, it doesn't hide the truth. It doesn't, it doesn't run from the truth. Love doesn't ignore issues and problems and things that need to be addressed. Love does that. It deals with the truth, but it does it in a way that pleases God. So love is always bearing all things. It puts up with all things. It believes all things. It hopes in all things and endures all things. So this is what love does. This is a description of what love does positively, but then negatively. Let me just read through some of these here. It does not envy. Now, that was Miriam's problem in Numbers chapter 12. She didn't love Moses at that moment. She was envious of her brother. You see, love and envy cannot exist in the same heart. In fact, it says here it doesn't it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't become arrogant, which Miriam did both of those things when she became critical of Moses. She became envious, she became boastful and and proud. She was elevating herself. Love isn't proud, love isn't rude. Now there's an important one that I think we need to remember. Leviticus 19. Speak frankly with your neighbor. That's not an excuse to be rude. It's not an excuse to be demoralizing or to be demeaning. Love doesn't do that. So even when I feel like I need to offer a a sense of critical input for the purpose of helping a person be mindful of maybe a mistake they made or a potential mistake they are going to make, I have to do it in a way that is not rude. It's not, love is not self-seeking. Love is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Now, when you think through your tendency likely to be critical and your your tendency to be judgmental and to have a, a critical spirit, we have to identify how that relates to 1 Corinthians 13 as We find in Leviticus 19 that we are to love our neighbor. 1 Corinthians 13 shows us what that looks like. Let me mention this very briefly, too. A number of years ago, a book came out called The Five Love Languages of Love by a man named Chapman. It's a good book. It's worth your time. It's a book that's worth reading. But the more I began interacting with that book and people who had read that book, I felt like, especially in marriages, that there was this attempt that I had to find the exact perfect love language of my spouse. Otherwise, I wasn't showing them love. And the more I started thinking about it, well, there's something to that. Um, I know for me, um, gifts don't mean all that much to me. They're, they're fine, but they don't, they don't speak love to me. Um, words of affirmation far more speak love and appreciation to me than gifts or acts of service and 
physical touch and those things. That that's that doesn't speak love to me. What speaks love to me is words of affirmation. So there's something to that. But at the same time, I may not know a person's love language, but what I do know is 1 Corinthians 13 love always applies. It's always patient. It's always kind. It's never envious. It's never boastful. This kind of 1 Corinthians love in chapter 13 is love that works in every relationship that we have. So if I'm going to offer positive criticism for the spiritual benefit of a person, it has to be undergirded in 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, loving my neighbor. So as we close tonight, let me just offer for you six very brief truths about this kind of love. Biblical love, 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Well, number one, biblical love is an attitude of the heart and mind and will, not predominantly an emotion. Okay, not that emotions are not involved, but it is an action. It is an attitude that is a choice, a choice that I make, a self-sacrificing choice that I make for the spiritual benefit of another person. Your attitudes are a choice. Someone can disappoint me. They can hurt me. They can offend me, but I must choose love. I must choose the attitude of love for the spiritual benefit of another person. Number two, biblical love is a choice. As I mentioned, it is not accidental. It's not based on uncontrollable feelings. Our feelings are important, okay? Our feelings, our emotions are part of the reality of being created in the image of God. Our feelings and emotions are a window into our soul, they tell us when something's wrong. They, they inform us that something is a little off in our spirit. So we don't want to ignore them. We're not robots. We're not, we're not free from emotion. We don't want to be free from emotion, nor do we want to be controlled by emotion. And so this biblical love is not an accident. It is done by choice. Number three, love is primarily an action. It's primarily something that I do. I practice patience. I practice kindness. I practice these things in my relationships, even when I feel critical toward another person. Number four, and these are all kind of building off each other. Love is an act of my will. Now, I would, I would clarify that one. My will is imperfect and sinful. So really, love is a supernatural action that flows from a changed heart. It is from a heart that refuses to disobey God and refuses to be a slanderer. It refuses to attack my neighbor. It refuses to ignore problems, but it deals with them frankly. It deals with them truthfully, and it deals with them lovingly, and that requires the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God. Number five, you have, to, you have to choose to replace your critical attitude with an attitude of love. How would your relationships change today, right now? Your marriage, your work environment, your, your friend group, how would they change right now today if you made the decision to put away your critical negative spirit and replaced it with an attitude of love? How would your relationships change? Now, some of you, the people that you were trying to show love to might have reticence because they might say, what happened? Why is this person suddenly being so nice and kind and patient. Maybe they're after something. You might have to work through that if you're known as a person with a critical spirit. But I, I promise you, on the other side of that, that brings healthy relationships. It brings a relationship where there is patience and kindness and there is open, frank conversations that dwell on the truth that are for the spiritual benefit of each person involved in the relationship. Now, let me give you the sixth and final one, and that is agape love, biblical love, puts another person before me. 
Love in this biblical context is not sentimentalism. It's not emotion. It is the choice to love my neighbor as I love myself. This is the way that we get out of the trap of having a critical spirit. We can all be critical from time to time. We all receive criticism from time to time. The question is, how are we going to receive criticism? And secondly, how are we going to give Christ-honoring feedback, positive criticism, helpful criticism that is given from a spirit of love? It happens when I choose. I make the choice to put off the old man that is filled with critical spirit and judgmentalism and put on the new man empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to love my neighbor as I love myself and to practice 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Thank you for joining us again tonight here at Grace Baptist Church. We look forward to jumping into our next uh, couple of sessions, uh, next session next week and our next attitude to put off and then followed by an attitude to put on. So we're excited to have you back next week as we jump into our next attitude. And so please make sure you mark your calendar and join us next Wednesday as well. Uh, I'm going to end our time together tonight with a brief word of prayer. And then I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, forgive us for the times that we are critical of others and help us empower us, Lord, to have this spirit of love that we are showing patience and kindness and biblical love to one another. Lord, we ask your blessing on the rest of our week and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to being back with you again next week. Have a good week.